So we're continuing and hope to finish up today, we are finishing up today, the third and final session on what the Bible says about capital punishment. We have gone through a lot of material, so I'm not going to go through it again. But um, we were talking, we were zeroing in on what the Bible says. We had talked about the different philosophical arguments regarding capital punishment, both pro and con. And then we began to focus upon what the Bible says, which of course to us as Christians is um, the most important source and is our base for truth and for activity and action in, in our lives here on earth. And we had talked about the fact that we talked about the illustration that Jesus forgave the dying thief next to him, but he did not supernaturally take him down for the cross, from the cross. The, the thief actually paid the penalty as was apportioned by the government at that point, but of course received salvation. And then we quickly talked about the fact that uh, capital punishment really is based upon God's tremendous respect for human life. And that the fact that the Bible says in Genesis, the ninth chapter, verse six, in, in the image of God, God has made mankind. And he said that whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. And the reason for that is for they are created, man is created in the image of God. So as contradictory as it may seem, the capital punishment, um, the death penalty, is actually an example of God's respect for life and, and his effort to uh, not only apportion justice, as we've talked about many times, the Bible speaks about justice over and over again, and God is a God of justice, but also to impress upon us and upon mankind as a whole the, the um, respect that we should have for human life. And of course, today we know that we have by and large lost a lot of respect for human life, both from the point of conception all the way through the point of, to the point of, of uh, our senior citizens. We're seeing a continual decay of respect for human life. And then we went into the fact that uh, the Bible has given a certain responsibility to government. There is a specific role that has been given to government. It's been appointed by God. We used Romans the 13th chapter, and even Jesus reinforced that when he stood before the governor, the procurator of, of Rome, and he said to him, you would have no authority over me except it had been given to you from above. So even Jesus reinforced the fact that there is an authority that has been given by God that has been apportioned to human government, and that human government has a role in punishing evil. Uh, the, two, the two parallels or the two pillars are that human government is to promote the good and reinforce the good and to punish evil. Those are the two major responsibilities of human government, to reinforce and promote good and to punish evil. And it is distinct from the role of the kingdom of God. There has been confusion on the part of some Christians, and even yet today many Christians, who say, but in the New Testament, Jesus taught that if someone slaps you on the right cheek, strikes you on the right cheek, turn to them the left as well. But that is, that is regarding individual, individual conduct versus collective government uh, appointment and assignment from God. There are things that God has given to government, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but there are things that God has given to government that out of his mercy, he has not assigned to individuals. We, and, and there's other reasons for the assignments that God has given to government. Now, can government be corrupted? Absolutely, we know that. But that's not God's ideal. God's ideal was to establish government here on earth to keep order and to promote safety and to promote actually prosperity for the people over whom government presides. 
But there are some tasks that are assigned to government, such as the sword, that actually is merciful by God in that we as individuals do not have to carry that out. There are some assignments that I don't want to carry out. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Just the other, this other night, uh, the other night at the county fair, this has been Columbiana County Fair week. And because I'm running for office, it's a bittersweet experience. I love county fairs. I like the atmosphere. I like putting on my blue jeans and we like wandering through the barns. And we went to the pig sale uh, a, few, a little bit, you know, to watch the pigs. The kids show their pigs and the pigs to be auctioned off and judged. And I'm going to tell you what, that judge knew more about pigs than I'm just, I'm just astonished. Well, he knew more about pigs than I care to know. I mean, I just, I mean, too much information. I mean, that pig would walk out and he would talk about its bone structure, its skeletal structure, the size of its feet, the way its hips were and the way it carried its, I'm thinking all about, you're just making this up, right? And so we like wandering through the barns and I like going down, we go down to the dairy, if you know where the milkshake uh, shack is down there by the barns and and I've worked in there by the way until this year thank God we didn't have to but uh, I've mixed those milkshakes one night we mixed 800 I think milkshakes and my arms my arms were sore the next day from mixing milkshakes because people are people are very impatient <laughs> when it's hot and they've ordered a purple cow or a black cow Purple cow, isn't it? Purple cow. So coming up, coming up. So I love, we, we like county fairs, but I don't care for them when I'm running for office because I don't, who wants to go to a county fair and talk about politics? But we've been there almost every night but one. And the one night, our, one of our ladies that helps the county coroner came in and we were talking with her. And some of the cases that she, some of the things she has had to see as assisting the coroner here in Columbiana County, I'm not even going to go into detail. Those are things that you and I have been spared from because she has that assignment as part of the government. And so God has, God has given an assignment to government in part to spare individual citizens from doing something that could be very unpleasant. And of course, you, wielding the sword is one of, one of those. So God distinguishes between individuals and governments. Now you remember that God said in Romans the 12th chapter, verse 19, Paul told the believers never to avenge themselves, but to leave it to the wrath of God. What we may sometimes think is the wrath of God will be played out somehow, somewhere, in some way that um, you know, the, 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 the cool woke thing to say now is karma. Well, we don't believe in karma as Christians. That's connected with another religion. We believe in the sovereignty and the, and the, the providence of God Almighty. And so sometimes we think in some manner, in some way, God's going to make things right. And that does happen. But we forget that God has also put into place through government a means by which he will avenge the innocent through their actions. So Paul said, Don't, do not avenge yourselves, leave it to the wrath of God. I think it's important that Romans 13, 4, as we pointed out, uh, 13, 4 and, and says this, they are, they are God's servants, listen to this, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So we just read the scripture where God said, don't avenge yourself, leave it to the wrath of God. How does God's wrath work? He told us in Romans 13, 4, that government, government agents are agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. Now the Greek word there for wrath is the word avenger. Now it's more than ironic that Paul told us as individual believers, do not avenge yourselves. For God, God will, God has a process, God has a way of bringing about justice. And then in Romans 13, God inspired, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to use the very same word and in describing individuals in government that they are to be the avenger. They've been given that assignment by God. 
The other reason that God has given this assignment to government is, and by the way, it is to be proportional. So let me back up even one more step. Capital punishment is not to be exercised by an individual. God is saying, and there's a reason for that, because that's called revenge. And God tells us that we're not to seek revenge. Capital punishment is to be distinguished from revenge. Capital punishment is retribution. Retribution is different than revenge. Revenge is often not proportional to the crime. Revenge is personal. Retribution is to be fitting and non-personal. It is to be proportional. Now the word for that is lex talionis. That's the Latin legal term. I don't know if I put it up up here or not. Did I put it? Yeah, yes. Lex talionis, which means lex is law of the talion, which means the punishment is to fit the crime. That is a law, a rule of justice. If justice is to be just, the punishment is to fit the crime. The punishment, therefore, should not be less than the crime, and the punishment should fit the crime, and it should not be more than the crime. And we talked in earlier sessions about cruel and unusual punishment, and the fact that our forefathers put that in some of our founding documents, because prior to that, the, the, the work of government or the, the actions of government in prior many years gone by, as we talked about drawn and quartered, do you remember that? And that was an English law where they would draw and quarter someone. That's a cruel and unusual punishment. What, it, what takes place today, even in regards to the carrying out and the fulfillment of the death penalty, as you know from if you're, you're in touch at all with the news, is often they seek the most painless and quick way of executing an individual. They don't seek the, the most torturous way. That's how Jesus died. Jesus died with, with, under, under a death penalty that was actually researched by the Romans to be the most painful and prolonged way in which a person could die. The Phoenicians invented it. The Phoenician government invented crucifixion, but the Romans perfected it. They could crucify thousands in a day. They actually had stockyards, stockpiles of crosses and nails, and, and, and the soldiers would go and just get, like you're building a house, they would get everything they know. How many do we have crucified? And they knew what to get. They actually had it all ready. And the, that was a cruel and unusual punishment. That was designed to, to cause torture as much as possible to the individual. God does not, thankfully, thankfully, because our justice system was based upon biblical values, which we may talk about a little bit later in the, in the following service, not necessarily in regards to the justice system, but was based upon biblical values. The, it was based upon retribution, lex talionis, instead of revenge, as least, at least as great as the crime. Therefore, capital punishment is not to be used for revenge, but retribution. So it's a matter of retribution to be exercised as a requirement from the Lord to uphold the sanctity of human life in a society. So the motivation behind capital punishment is to uphold the sanctity of human life in a, in a society. It's to fit the crime. And we talked earlier, we actually talked and covered the fact that there is disagreement on whether it is actually um, something that, that is a motivation, uh, that, it is, you know, that it is not only based upon God's justice, but it's meant to be a deterrent, and there are some who say it isn't a deterrent, but as I read to you, uh, surveys indicate, even in prison, that 99% of those in prison say the death penalty is a deterrent. Now, I believe that when it is not a deterrent is when there are unending appeals, which we see today. Appeal after appeal after appeal that can stretch out sometimes for decades, 
And we talked about the fact that the Bible also addresses that issue that justice is to be swiftly rendered. Notice the terminology there, justice, not, not payback, not revenge, not a hit. Justice is to be served swiftly. Otherwise, it says evil will grow in a society. We're witnesses of that. Because, because there are unending appeals, there's no fear. Because they know they can be caught up in the court system. We also read to you, uh, just for those of you that did not hear this, an astonishing fact. And I probably can't find it. The median average time convicted murderers spend behind bars is seven years in the United States. Now, is that Lex Talionis? So your, your wife, your husband, your daughter, your, your grandchild was murdered, cruelly murdered, and the individual spent seven years in an air-conditioned prison working out and is released. One of every seven inmates sentenced to life for murder serves three years or less. So we have two extremes. And again, what does the Bible have to say about this? So it is to be proportional, proportional. It is to be according to the crime. And of course the maximum we or the justice system in the United States does not fit the type of execution or the fulfillment of capital punishment to the severity or perhaps we might even use the sickness and perversity of the crime. But mercifully, the death penalty is the same for everyone according to the laws of that state. If it is lethal injection, regardless of the details of the, of the crime, it is lethal injection for everyone. And so it is not that the government even says, all right, you tortured and did X, Y, Z, so we're now going to up the way you die. It is all, it is all the maximum is death. And that is death by the quickest and most painless method that government can find. So that's what we're talking about in the United States of America. Chuck Colson, how many of you have heard of Chuck Colson? Chuck is a, um, he was a former um, member of the cabinet of Nixon's team and was convicted uh, during Watergate, served time in prison. A very brilliant man, found, actually came, became a Christian, a born again Christian while in prison, became a strong advocate for Christianity and very intelligent attorney and a very um, effective voice regarding social issues and where what the Bible has to say about them for the remaining years of his life and when he was released from prison. For many, many years, Chuck Colson, uh, and again, a very intelligent attorney, was against capital punishment. But I actually have in my file and uh, printed out is his article, Why I Believe in Capital Punishment. His philosophy changed. Even, even after studying the Bible, he was still against capital punishment. But his philosophy changed when he had a soul-rocking personal interview for over one hour with John Wayne Gacy. Some of you may remember him. John Wayne Gacy was convicted of murdering at least that they could discover 33 young men and boys in Norwood, Norwood Park Township near Chicago, Illinois. He tortured them, he molested them, then he brutally murdered them, 33 at least. He admitted to those. And Colson, while advocating for non-capital punishment, for life in, in prison, had an opportunity to sit down with him to try to talk with him about Christ. He said in his hour-long conversation, he was astonished that John Wayne Gacy was totally unrepentant and in fact arrogant. In fact, he claimed he was a Christian. 
and did not show a bit of remorse over anything that he had done. And it was horrendous. It was horrendous. And his last, so Colson left that prison cell and his philosophy flipped. And he said there are times when superior force is required and that that capital punishment is actually a responsibility of government. The last words, by the way, of John Wayne Gacy before he was executed were, kiss my... The very last words came out of his mouth. So let's, let's, let's go to some final thoughts. The Bible says murder pollutes a nation and believe it or not, only capital punishment cleanses it. It says that in Numbers 35, 33, do not pollute the land where you are, he said to the Israelites. Bloodshed pollutes the land and atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed except by the blood of the one who shed it. Numbers 35, 33. Ezekiel 13, 9, God, God was judging Israel and he said, one of the reasons I'm judging you is because you have been lying to my people who listen to lies. You have killed those who should not have died. Hmm. Let, let me read that again, America. You have killed those who should not have died and have spared those who should not live. And that was God's charge against his own people saying, that's not justice. So murder pollutes a nation and only capital punishment cleanses from it. Then secondly, God judges nation harshly who do not punish murder. Jeremiah 2.34, on your clothes is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor because you will not carry out justice. And so God has given a specific assignment to government it's an unpleasant assignment sometimes. <laughs> I'm smiling because I, I, I'm trying to think of, well, I guess there are some pleasant assignments from serving in government. <laughs> but but it, it is an unpleasant assignment, very unpleasant. And, and unless someone has a very wicked, twisted heart or mind, I don't see the individuals who carry out these orders as enjoying it at all, but it's part of, part of their assignment from God. And the Bible then goes on to say that justice sometimes demands superior force. Justice sometimes demands superior force. We have examples of that uh, over and over again. We have an example that's, it occurs to me, we have an example that's taking place right now over in Israel. That justice demands superior force. What do we believe that Israel's response should be to the horrendous attack on their people, on innocent people, on children, on babies, by Hamas and by terrorists? Should they have just backed away and, and receded, receded, retreated, retreated? Or does the government have a right? Does the government have a responsibility to protect through superior force against evil that is encroaching upon the innocent? And I believe that God is a God of justice. He's also a God of common sense, right? And I believe that, that God gave government again, for the protection of citizens and protection of the innocent, those who cannot defend themselves and those who cannot take care of themselves. And so they had to stop it. I remember sharing with you the story of Sergeant York, and it's just a tremendous illustration of Alvin York. Alvin York was from the hills of mountains of Tennessee. He was drafted in World War I he was a, a Christian, came from a very strong Christian background, was an expert rifleman, expert marksman. They had turkey shoots in that county, and Alvin always won the turkey shoots. They said he was incredible. 
And uh, my first pastor that I remember, Reverend Teasdale, Ellis Teasdale, was a personal friend of Alvin York. Alvin York preached the gospel after World War I and receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was a holiness preacher, and my pastor shared services with him and knew Alvin York personally. But as you, many of you know the story, he captured hundreds, single-handedly, uh, hundreds of German soldiers. It was trench warfare, and they, were, they would fight from trench to trench across no man's land. It was insane warfare of which the enemy would put barbed wire and, and, and deep holes filled with water and I mean all types of things. And then on the opposite side, they would level machine guns against, against the enemy. And so his, his platoon was ordered to charge, I believe it was a hill, and they were in no man's land and the machine guns, the German machine guns were just mowing, mowing it, almost his whole, his, his, his sergeant was killed. He just watched them all being cut down and he took over and he told the men to stay there. And he by himself went from cover to cover, wove his way up through until he got into a position where he could silence those machine guns. And he actually, he actually used a turkey call because the Germans were down low and he actually used the same call that he used in Tennessee to get the turkeys to stick their head up. <laughs> he went and he said the Germans stuck their head up and he, he single-handedly and then he flanked a trench which means that he could they were this way looking that way and one by one he began to shoot them until finally they surrendered and 200 and some German soldiers came marching out of that trench with their hands up. And they asked him afterwards, what made you, you were a, you were a pacifist, you were a, a, a conscientious objector. You said you would not shoot anyone. What made you kill those Germans? And he said, when I saw the death that was coming out of those guns and people dying, he said, I had to silence those guns. And the reporter said, so you, you did what you did to save lives. And he said, yes, I did. That's why I did it. And so the role uh, of government, and we've crossed over into the subject of just war. Is there such a thing as just war? Is war hell? Sherman said that in, in the Civil War, and it is. Only those of you who have experienced it and have had a little taste of it can even describe what war is like. It, it is... That's why so many, so many of our soldiers come back and fight PTSD and the things that they've seen. It is hell. But is war sometimes necessary? I believe the Bible says it is for these reasons and many more because of the evil that exists in the world. Because of individuals like Hitler, right? Who will not stop until he enslaves everyone and murders indiscriminately people of certain race, it has to be stopped by superior force. So finally, last point, capital punishment does not limit, there was a question by Christine Coots, capital punishment does not limit the mercy or the grace of God. It does not limit the mercy or grace of God. You say, well, it takes away time. It does not take away the, first of all, it does not take away the love of God for every individual that you and I would find in our human effort impossible to love. God so loved this world and it says that he gave his only son that whoever, whoever, regardless, believes in him should not perish. So we trust, we trust the heart of God and the heart of God is to save. That's, that's his heart, to bring people into the kingdom. The incredible power of the blood of Jesus is underestimated. That when our Savior died on the cross, and, and that event took place, and the earth itself and creation itself reacted to what was happening, 
we, we have no idea, I think, as to the level and limit that the blood of Jesus can cleanse. And it can cleanse from any sin. So it does not limit the mercy or the grace of God. I also believe that the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. So we have to believe that if indeed God has assigned to government the role of lex talionis, just punishment, and that that includes uh, capital punishment, then we have to believe that God, even with this John Wayne Gacy, we have to believe that God somehow, some way, because he's a righteous God, gave him the opportunity to repent. That at some point, there was an opportunity. Someone spoke to him. Well, we know Chuck Colson did. We know that he went to press the, 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 the opportunity for forgiveness to him. And so we have to believe that God, otherwise, on the day of judgment, I was thinking earlier before the before the class began. I thought it'd be nice to have some music. That was my five-minute warning. That's great. Yeah, that's a nice way to do it. It's better than an alarm. But um, now I lost my train of thought completely. We were talking about the mercy and grace of God. Oh, He's not willing that any should perish but that all might come to repentance. So we know the heart of God. Spurgeon made a very famous statement, and I've used it many, many times in, in incredibly difficult circumstances. Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, the, the prince of preachers in London uh, that pastored the London Tabernacle in the 1800s, Spurgeon said, when I cannot trace God's hand, when I cannot trace his hand, in other words, when I don't understand why he's going this direction, why he's doing this. When I cannot trace his hand and figure it out, I can trust his heart. When I cannot trace his hand, I can trust his heart. And so that role that God has, we have to assume that the role that God, God has given government, that he himself is responsible for reaching the souls through us, of course, through the church, but no one will stand before the Lord, I believe, and, and be able to say, I never, ever, you never spoke to my heart. That would be an unjust God. And the Bible says that even those outside of the law have the law written in their hearts. And that there is something down deep in our heart. We may not know the law. We may not have ever heard of Jesus. But there's something deep in our heart, and we, and we fight against it because of sin. But in other words, God has created man in his own image, and there are certain tribal laws that, have, that live in jungles. They have tribal laws. And in fact, I read one time that every tribe that they have ever discovered has a, an internal law against adultery. Every tribe. Now, where did that come from? God has written his law in their hearts. And so they will be judged according to how did they respond to the light they have been given. But it's our responsibility to get the gospel to everyone. And not just so that they can become a Christian and make it to heaven. Of course, we want to go to heaven. But we need to recognize that if we don't see living as a Christian as beneficial here on earth, then we have the wrong idea we, we really do not know the Christ of the Bible and the relationship we can have with him. We're still under the law, right? I really don't want to do this, but I'm going to go to heaven, right? And so we're, we're, we're blessed and we've got to share that blessing with others. Okay, what time is it? 10.08. I finished up a little, uh, two minutes early. Sing to us. We'll turn the music up. Any questions? Any, any one question? Any questions? <clears throat> Verses for Numbers and Jeremiah again. Yeah.
You sure can once I once I find it here. 3533. Was that right? Numbers 3533. Ezekiel. And did you say Jeremiah? Numbers. Oh, yeah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 234. Yeah, I wrote it in green to differentiate, but maybe it isn't easy to read. I need to stick with black and. Sorry, I need to remember the age of my class. Uh oh. Uh oh. It's the glare. Oh, is it? You know, we're going to um, we're going to be putting some different lighting up here, and uh, lighting that will spotlight here, and we can reduce these then, so that we don't have to reduce them all at the same time. All right.